Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah is the highest praise. It's the, the one word that gets us close to giving the thanks and praise to God that God deserves. So I think you can do better than that this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. The word amen means it is so. <laughs> So praise God with the highest praise that we have language for. It is so. It is so. It is so. Amen. <sighs> Hallelujah. Amen. Today we begin a series on gratitude called More Than Enough. And the question for us in this series is, is God more than enough for us? Is there something else that we depend on instead of God? And if we are depending on something other than God, how are we going to get it together? Today, the sermon topic is grief, grace, and gratitude, and we begin in the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, in verses 21 through 26. Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry. And he's trying to help the disciples understand what is about to happen. And even though Jesus has told the disciples over and over and over again that he will go to death for us, they still can't quite wrap their minds around it. Peter has just said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Some are confused that you are John the Baptist. Some are confused that you are the prophet Elijah. And some others are confused that you might be the prophet Jeremiah. But you are the Messiah, the living God. But then, beginning in verse 21... From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But then Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you are a hindrance to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose their souls? Or what will they give in return for their lives. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are indeed our worthy and our holy God. So pour out on us, O oh God. Speak, Lord, for we have not come to hear a word from Jasmine, but we have come expecting a word from you. Preach, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. More than enough. More than enough means that we have an overflow. More than enough means that we are past the level of capacity. More than enough means that we have exactly what we need and now even more and even more and even more. It is a place of abundance. After all, Jesus has come so that we might have life and have it in abundance. The problem with this is that humans have somehow found themselves in a place of scarcity. We live our lives in a scarcity mindset, always worried that we might not have what we need always gathering more than what we need because there might come, say, a rainy day. And yet we serve the God of abundance. Pastor Adam Hamilton says that we suffer from a disease called affluenza. <laughs> He, he says that we suffer from needing to be more affluent, to have more than enough, to do more than we need to do, to have more than we need to have, so that we might feel like we are worthy. And yet, when we come to days like today, when the grief rises up as we call the names of those that we miss and we can see them sitting in the pews that they once occupied, we learn that there is nothing that we can have that replaces the people we miss. Grief, grace, gratitude is a phrase that I learned from our preacher who will be with us next week, the Reverend Dr. Rodney Thomas Smothers. And, and I learned from him that the journey of losing a loved one is a journey from grief to grace to gratitude. That when we lose someone, when we lose something that's important to us, our first stop is grief. And there are five stages of grief, so we stay with grief for a while. We're sad. We're in disbelief. We are angry. We're spinning our wheels trying to figure out what's next, how to put one foot in front of another. And then we become to live in grace. To the days become maybe not less hard, but more doable. We, we wake up and we don't start the day in deep grief. But we begin to start the day saying, Okay, maybe I can do this thing called life again. We begin to start to figure out a new routine, a new way of being. And we start to put one foot in front of another. And then we pick up the pace a little bit. 
And then when we think of them, we don't fall so deep into great into grief that we're in despair, but we get a smile on our faces. And we begin to thank God for the memories that we have, for the moments that we shared, and for the life that fuels us to keep on keeping on. We begin to live as a part of their legacy in gratitude. When we live that grief to grace to gratitude life, We find ourselves living the abundant life. We find ourselves living the more than enough life. That our stuff becomes less important. Our bank account balances don't rule the day. But the grace and the love and the gratitude is what keeps us moving and what keeps us going. And that affluenza, that illness that attacks us, it just doesn't drive us like it used to. Peter, (laughs) some know him as the disciple Simon Peter. He was a trip, (laughs) y'all. And, and, and I love digging into the disciples because they're so very human and we can see ourselves in them in a way that helps us to get over our spiritual speed bump. Peter was with Jesus from the very beginning. Peter was the one who tried to walk on water and then got scared and started drowning. Peter is the one whom Jesus says on this rock, I will build my church and, and there are no, and you have, and I have the keys to hell and nothing shall prevail against my church. Peter is the first pope of the Catholic movement. Peter is the one who's supposed to get it. Peter is the one who's supposed to understand the mission and the purpose of Jesus. Peter declares, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Peter says, you get him, right? Jesus, you don't have to suffer and die. God forbid it. God interrupt it. God keep it from happening. And Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are setting your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of humans. When we set our things on the, when we set our eyes and our minds on the things of humans, we get confused. We get stuck in grief. We get stuck in pain. We get stuck in drama. We get stuck in affluenza. We get stuck in what things look like. We get stuck in what we want. We get stuck in what we think things should look like. We get stuck in scarcity. We get stuck in woe is me. We get stuck. And all we can see is what we want. Instead of 
of what God wants. And Jesus says here, as long as you are stuck in what you want, you are in my way. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in Jesus' way. I don't want to be in the way of the Lord. I don't want to be stuck. I don't want to be tired. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be always fighting and in drama. I don't want to be the one who is in the way of the Lord. Jesus told the disciples, if any of you want this abundant life, if any of you want this way forward, if any of you want to follow me, then give up what you want. Leave behind what you think things should look like. Give up on your way of doing things. Put down, I have to. Change your vision. Lose your life. And follow me. I don't know about you, but to be told to lose my life when I've buried so many people, I've lost so many friends, I've held the hands of folks in hospitals and cemeteries. I've been so weak that it was hard to stand up as the undertaker and the cemetery personnel (laughs) lowered the casket into the grave. I've seen the children of my friends who died way too soon wonder what their parent was like and grow up without them. And so this phrase, to, to lose my life, is jolting. It, is, it, 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 it keeps my attention because I need to understand why the Lord would give me life to help me lose my life. And it keeps you stuck in the grief place. And it's taken a long time and a lot of work and a lot of studying the Bible and a lot of hanging out with the saints to understand that to lose life literally means to give away what I want. It's not a physical death, but it is a death to having my way. It is a death to doing what I want to do. It is a death to going to where I want to go. It is a death to, to living the way that I am tempted to live. It is a death to going the way everybody else is going. And it is to live in a countercultural way. It is to live against the status quo, to live against what everybody else is doing, to indeed say yes when everybody else is saying no, to show up when nobody else is showing up. 
to say I'm sorry when nobody else is saying I'm sorry. To say I'll be with you when everybody else is scattered away. To be nice when everybody else is being mean. To be generous when everybody else is being stingy. To stand firm when everyone else is running away afraid. I've met a lot of church people in my life. And I wish I had met a lot of disciples. Because we're not the same thing. It's, it's not the same thing. Church people say they love Jesus. They say they follow Jesus. They think that faithfulness is the badge of honor. But to be a disciple means that you actually follow the commands of Jesus Christ. Church folks, get membership. but struggle with discipleship. You're gonna get that one day. P Peter, Peter got it. He got what it meant to be a member of the club. He, he, he got what it meant to follow Jesus around. He got what it meant to do the things that Jesus told him to do, but he didn't have it internally. He didn't understand that it meant good and bad. What I want and what I don't want. That, that it meant there would be good times and there would be hard times. That following Jesus actually meant that there would be death and there would be life. Peter wanted the upside of membership. He wanted to tell people what to do. He, not, not here at Atlanta first, but I know of other churches where, where people think that being a member of the church means that you pay to play. So if I pay, you do what I tell you to do. Not here. I'm telling you, it's not, not here. That membership means that because I can have my name on a wall or on a pew or on a window, then I'm good with the Lord. Peter got all of that. But what he didn't get was the clues that Jesus had been dropping the whole time. In this life, there will be trouble. But if you hang in with me, <laughs> I will overcome the world. Peter missed the point about people will not like you because you won't do things that they want you to do. He, he, he missed that thing. Peter missed the thing about it is your faith that will get you through. Not your bank account, not where you live, not your family, not your friends, not how you feel today, not who you have access to, not your network. It will be your faith. That gets you through. People ask me all the time, Pastor, I had this great life, then something happened, you know, the stock market crashed, or this thing happened, or the rubber hit the road, my friend died, my spouse died, and now I just, I don't know how to keep going. Is God upset with me? Did I do something wrong? And oftentimes I struggle with how to answer that question. Because I, I don't want to make people feel bad and I can be a little sarcastic sometimes. Y'all know that about me. 
Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> but if Jesus said, I'm going to go suffer and die so that you can have your life, so that you can live your life. And the only thing I ask is that you do life the way I ask you to do it. Then are we immune from the rough stuff in life? Or should we expect it? I think sometimes we get like Peter. And we mistake abundant life for an easy life. We mistake the promise of abundant life for smooth sailing in life. And yet we know that someday in life, we will have to go through this grief, grace, gratitude cycle. Something will happen. That causes us to say, God, are you with me? And we will have to make the choice to say, not only am I with you, God, but I give you everything, everything, everything I have, everything I am, and everything I hope to be. That's the only way to get to the more than enough life. The only way to get to the more than enough life is to lose what you want and to live what God wants. What would it profit a man if they gain the whole world and lose their souls? What will it profit them if nobody remembers them when they die? What will it profit them if nobody cares when we light a candle in their name? What will they gain if they've gained everything else but nobody's real sure where they're going to spend eternity? What will they give so that they might have life? What will you give so that you might have life? Thank you for being in worship today. Wherever you are, remember that you are created for this more than enough life. And wherever you are, either in grief or grace or gratitude, Know that God is with you. And wherever you are, know that you have a new opportunity to gain life with God. Go forth from this place, but not from the presence of the Almighty God, knowing that you know, that you know, that you know that you are loved, that you are adored, that God is with you, and that you live with
a more than enough life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.